Hey everyone. So today I am planting this bird of paradise as the centerpiece in the urn in the middle of the garden. Now, um, I had put a new potting mix in here in spring when I planted this up for spring. So I didn't replace any of that. I did add some time release fertilizer already, but I'm using a lot of tropicals in containers this year. And I'll tell you why it's because of this foliage tropicals do bold foliage better than any other plant. So that's what we're doing a lot of this year. And of course they are not winter hardy here. So if I care to, I can bring them inside and try to overwinter them as house plants, in some cases in other ways. So last year I did a coffee cups cold occasion this urn and that was a stunning plant and I loved it. But one of the things I noticed was with that darker, almost olive to borderline purple foliage in that plant, it kind of got lost with the backdrop of cedars here. So I wanted to add something with a lighter color leaf that I thought would stand out better. So that's how we ended up with this bird of paradise. I also wanted something that had a really nice vase shape. And of course, this is a perfect vase shape. So we're going to add a few other things to this container, but we have some other projects going on today as well. So I'm going to start with the trailers because believe it or not, I haven't exactly figured out what I want in the center of this container yet. And we've got um, two, you know, very different in foliage and color that I think is going to make this stand out in this garden. So first we've got Tradscantia. This is, I think, Purple Heart. This is the striped one, I think. We've got, it's called Pink Stripes. And then this might look a little bit familiar to you. This is Dichondra Emerald Falls. You're probably familiar with Silver Falls, the really beautiful silver foliage version of this. Well, this is the same plant in green. So we're going to alternate these around the edge of the pot. Now we could stop here and I think this would be a beautiful container, but I'm definitely going to put this over the top. I'm just not exactly sure what's all going to go into this yet. So while we think about that, I want to take you over to a tree that's not looking so great after winter and talk to you about some thing we're going to deal with that. And then later on, we're going to talk a little bit about a really easy way to tie in sweet peas and some boxwood pruning tips when you're like me and you have boxwood blight on your property. Well, this is really a sad sight right here. This is Acer Shirazawanum Moonrise. And I actually planted this tree in a video pretty early on in, in my YouTube days, um, probably three or four years ago. We'll have to look that up three years ago, maybe. And it's been doing so well. Um, in fact, just this winter, I was remarking how happy I was with the height it's put on because I didn't want it to be the same as the blue globe spruce that is same height as a blue globe spruce behind me. And the intention of it was to screen the garage from the house a little bit. But as you can see, uh, it's had a rough go of it. Now, last summer was, was really quite bad. We had um, a, a significant drought for us. I always I always put an asterisk by that because I know there are people who suffer with true drought conditions, which, which we're talking about a regionalized drought here. And uh, I had so many things going on that, you know, some things got some special attention and extra water, but I was sort of thinking that this was established enough that it didn't need that special attention. And clearly it did. And a lot of times this is what happens with trees. You don't see the damage until the next year. The damage has happened, but it doesn't show up until the next year. And actually this whole thing was all butted out. There were buds and everything. It had started leafing out everywhere. Uh, and then it just stopped. And that can happen quite a bit. And usually what that's about is that trees have some energy stored in them. But what happens is that um, they just don't have enough energy to fully flush out. And so they, they flush out partly but not all the way. So I've been kind of babying this tree this spring. I've been giving it extra water. I've been watching it really carefully. I've been you know, urging it on. 
and that hasn't helped. And so clearly uh, what hasn't leafed out here isn't going to leaf out. Now, I don't think this is a disease situation. These trees are not particularly prone to disease. Um, and I don't, so I don't think that's what's going on. I think this is 100% drought related. So I've given this quite a bit of time to hopefully make some kind of miraculous recovery. Um, and I think that what's leafed out here is, is all there is left to save. So all there is left to do on this tree um, is to start cutting out the dead parts, which unfortunately is going to change the whole nature of what this tree will look like. But it's a lovely tree and perhaps in time it will grow into some sort of reasonable shape. Now, it's important to note that this tree is now considered to be in recovery. Um, it needs to be babied. It is no longer um, an established tree that can just go about its merry way, at least in my opinion. So the main thing I'll be doing is just keeping a really close eye on the water here and mulching it. And that's the main thing I want to do here. I'm not going to get into feeding it. Um, feeding a weakened plant um, that's sort of been struggling is often not the right thing to do because that can force it into pushing new growth that it really isn't capable of supporting. So right now what we want to do is worry about the health of what is here and supporting this. And then next year and in future years when it's on the road to recovery, um, we can encourage some new growth through some feeding and hopefully it will make a recovery. I will say though that I've had this happen with trees before and often when this happens, it's the start of a gradual decline. Um, I would hate to lose this tree. It's, it's a stunning tree and it's perfect for this spot in the garden. And now let's go back to check up on that container. Now back to happier things, which includes finishing this up. So there's two plants we're going to add to this. I had toyed with the idea of adding something like an unplugged blue salvia here because I'm playing with that in the window box and along the house. And so I thought that'd be a good plant to transition and add some cohesiveness. But instead, I think we're going to keep this since we've got this sort of bold theme going. We're going to stick with that bold theme. And uh, we're going to just go with two. One is this Sun Patience. This is Compact Rose. Last year I grew Sun Patience, not for the first time, but for the first time where I really used them heavily. And it was illuminating for me. Um, they flower, I think, and provide a better flower show than um, petunias do in some cases. And uh, they seem to just get big and bold color all year long, very low care. Um, I found nothing not to like about them. So um, we're going to go with three of these beauties. I didn't really mean to plant everything in this container in threes. It just seems to be how it's turning out. The next plant we're going to use is this beautiful Euphorbia Ascot Rainbow has this gorgeous uh, variegated foliage, just, just a touch of pink on the ends. And uh, this will get really quite big. Hopefully the uh, um, bird of paradise grows fast enough so that this will still stay sort of tucked under its leaves. This is a very busy part of the garden that this is in. So because there's so much going on, you do want this to have a little bit of simplicity to it, or at least make a big enough statement so that it doesn't get lost in the mishmash of what's going on around it. And of course, I will give this probably a weekly feeding once things have a chance to get in and get settled. I don't start that. I don't typically start weekly feedings until the beginning of July because really here, that's how long it takes before things get a lot of growth. And so they don't need that weekly feeding until they're really rooted in and starting to put on new growth. Okay, that's planted. Now let's go talk about some box of pruning. So you might recall that last year I had the unfortunate experience of finding boxwood blight in my yard. I was one, only the fifth confirmed case in our state in the home garden, um, not necessarily because I was only the fifth case, but because I knew what to look for and I sent samples in, which is the only way to really confirm boxwood blight. 
And uh, I removed those boxwoods, and so far, uh, I have not seen signs of blight on other boxwoods in the yard. But I have really changed how I uh, maintain them and how I work around boxwoods so as to not accidentally spread those spores. So part of that involves how I clip boxwoods. And I enjoy clipping boxwoods. I am by no means an expert at it. There are experts at this. I am not one of them, but I find it to be very therapeutic and fun and kind of an art form. And you just keep clipping until you like it or you get sick of it and then you stop. Now I have never clipped my boxwoods super, super tight. I loosely shape them, but I have never had a really tight hedge of boxwoods, um, which can lead to potential issues with boxwood blight because uh, you do want some airflow. Airflow has never been an issue for my boxwoods. But what you can do is inadvertently transfer blight spores from one to another on your tools, on your clothing, whatever. So I work on boxwoods in areas at a time because I figure if one that's very close to another one has blight, it's going to get there without me intervening. But there are a few steps I do take. So first of all, I clip with um, two tools. This is, you can clip with a lot of things. You can clip with a hedger, you can clip with all kinds of things, but these are the tools that I prefer. I like to do it all by hand because I don't have a ton of them. And like I said, I don't have any hedges. Um, so this is like a long bladed pruner. And then this winter I bought this one, which is sort of a, um, this is sort of a fine tuned pruner, kind of more like a scissors for smaller areas. But the key is this tool. Lysol. Now you can disinfect your blades in a lot of different ways, but Lysol has been found to uh, disinfect them as well as a lot of other things. I don't particularly care to soak my really good tools in a bleach solution. So I use Lysol. So the key with this is uh, don't wipe it off. So spray it on, let it drip dry a little bit. And then I use this between every single boxwood because it's an easy step that I can take. The other thing to do is to make sure that your tools are really, really sharp um, because any sort of unsharp cut, it's easier for diseases and things to get in there. So you'll notice that I have a big uh, tarp sheet, whatever this is actually um, harvest guard, covering this up because I wanna catch all of the clippings that I can. Now the timing on when you should prune your boxwoods is a subject of some debate. So here where it's cooler, basically what I do is I wait for this first flush of growth, which you can see all of this shaggy bits is all new growth. I wait for that, which is typically end of May, beginning of June. This year was a little later because we had a cooler season. I wait for that to go and then I try to get it before it gets too hot out. But in places like England, they prune boxwood year round. And one of the things you can do is you can actually like moisten a sheet and put a sheet over the top of it if you've got to do this on like a really um, sunny dry day it's sunny but it's cool here today and not dry um, you also don't want to do it when like there's a ton of rain in the forecast you want it to be dry for a little bit after you do it so that again you're not uh, risking any sort of fungal situation developing something like that now this is not so much an exercise in how to print your boxwoods because as I said, I'm not so good at it, but I find it really fun and I enjoy clipping away and uh, making new shapes and taking my time with it and standing back and just seeing, um, you know, really what I want this boxwood to become. And it's never perfect. And I guess that's not my point either. Well, it's been an incredibly slow start here in the vegetable garden because we've had such cool temperatures. Now we've got a little bit of heat going though, and it is time to check in on the sweet peas to make sure that they're going the right direction. 
So sweet peas will become self-supporting in time, but you have to get them headed in the right direction in order for that to happen. And you can tie them in using um, twine or something else for the first, say, foot to two feet, and then they'll take off and they'll start supporting themselves. But what I've been using lately are these little clips. They're simple little things, um, and I just pick them up, you know, on Amazon. You can probably find them in other garden stores. And instead of twine, I use these to clip on because they're very easy to get off. You don't have to have scissors or anything or move them around. It doesn't have to be well arranged. It just has to be headed upwards. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed following me along on some of the things that are happening in my garden right now. And I hope you are having a great day in your garden. Come along, visit me again. We'll spend some more time in the garden. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.